Hi, everyone, and welcome to Gigging Out, a podcast about the people and businesses leading the gig economy. I'm Dana Gagnon, CMO at Every, and today's episode is with Ryan Green, founder and CEO of Gridwise. Ryan signed up to drive for Uber in the early days of the app and realized just how difficult it was. From his experience, he built Gridwise, an app that provides rideshare and delivery drivers with the data and insights they need to maximize their earnings and improve their experience. In our discussion, we go in depth about what rideshare and delivery companies can do to improve the driver experience, and we provide advice on how to compete with gig economy giants like Uber. We also talk about shifting worker classification laws and where drivers stand on the manor. I know you'll love our conversation. And if you do, I encourage you to check out the 2023 Gig Driver Report that was just released by Every in the RMDA. It includes insights on how to provide a great experience for drivers. You can get your copy at every.com and it's also linked in the show notes. Enjoy. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for being here today on Gigging Out. I really appreciate you joining me. No, oh, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Yeah, so I would love to dive in. Um, tell the audience, what is Gridwise? What we are is the leading business app for gig economy drivers. So you think about those drivers who are working for Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, uh, so many different rideshare and delivery companies out there is where kind of where we focus our support on uh, with the gig, gig workers. We are think of us as this like business utility that's helping them to best like man like manage and and, and optimize their work on those companies. So they're using us uh, as an app to track all of their trips and finances and like their earnings, expenses, p l tax deductions. Uh, they're actually, we're, as we're collecting all of this activity and financial data around how they're working, we actually build insights off of that that we then feed back into the app to them to help them understand, hey, what's, what's demand trends look like by neighborhood in the city or what does airport demand look like and event demand and, and helping them really um, be able to uh, better inform when and where they should be working. Uh, we provide them access to benefits like dental, vision, affordable phone plans, uh, probably one of the most aggressive gas rebate programs and, and so many so many different things um, uh, that as this like again holistic business utility app for for the workers. If you broaden out our scope of just us as a platform, we actually are um, we we have an enterprise uh, side of our business as well. Um, cause really is like our, our focus as a platform and our mission is to improve the way people work and goods move. And so as we think about, we, we want to be very focused on empowering workers, but we don't want to like turn a, turn a blind eye to the impact that we can have on improving mobility. And so what we do to, um, make that impact is we actually, as we're collecting a lot of this mobility data around where trips are starting, where they're ending and uh, how workers are working, what their wages are, we start, we, we combine those into different uh, analytics products and offerings and then license that to companies that uh, we see align with like helping to drive kind of mobility for different ways, retail, real estate, um, cities, and so many other types of ent- entities that we work with there. That's super cool. Yeah, I was looking at your website and saw that you had a business side as well. I think it's such an interesting app idea because in our research, most gig drivers drive for two, at least two companies. Most drive for three to five companies. They're kind of patching together all of these roles. Are you are you doing things to connect drivers with employers as well with the companies that need them? Have you thought? Have you talked about that at all? Yeah, we, we, that is part of our enterprise side of our business is um, the way we connect them to companies, other companies today is through the advertising side of our business. So we want to make sure that, you know, we, Gridwise is not setting out to be everything for everyone. We do have our, our focus as a company and, and there's a lot of other companies out there that can help them earn more money, can help them drive safer, work smarter. And we want to make them aware of those. And so the way we connect them, uh, to those companies is through uh, uh, kind of native advertising placements that we provide within our application uh, to them. Before we go too far down the Gridwise story, I want to hear more about Ryan. What what led you to starting Gridwise? Oh yeah, it was uh, quite the I would say quite the non traditional path uh, getting into Gridwise. I didn't 
uh, have a background in, in starting and running tech companies before Gridwise really is. Uh, my path was like, let's take a, you know, go a few years ago, maybe not a few years, many years back to college. <laughs> I'd like to say a few years, but I'm not that young. Uh, and I am, and, and, and I was, uh, so I'm studying at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, military focused school, studied economics and Chinese. And I ended up, I, I've always had some kind of side hustle going on. I always caveat that with, you know, people think of a lot of things when you say that, a, a, a legal side hustle. And I, I've just been selling things since like sixth grade, nonstop. And, and that kind of all, like all those behaviors led up to me for like first, like starting my first company during my last year at the Naval Academy with a few other partners in the financial services space that, similar to Gridwise in a way where we were aggregating all this content and information that would help people teach people how to understand and uh, invest in and trade in the foreign exchange currency markets. And then connected them, our platform connected them with vetted traders who actually, and investors who traded and invested for a living, put food on the table every day from their investments in the markets, uh, the currency markets at the time. And, and so like that was, like when we started that, I didn't know how to even purchase a domain. I mean, figure that part out pretty quickly. And then like, uh, and then just learned how to, I was doing this while in college. I graduated in the Naval Academy, went into uh, active duty military as a Naval officer and was still running this company with the other partners who were also in the military. And, and we just learned how to stand up a business, how to bootstrap it, how to build a team, how to build a, a web platform and, and things um, I wouldn't say it was technically very sophisticated, but it was, uh, it was, it allowed us to, it was like a sandbox. It allowed us to make a lot of mistakes uh, and learn. Um, and we ended up shutting it down after two years is um, not due to all the, just all the mistakes, but the, the primary reason was we were all active duty military on planes and boats around the world. So it's really hard to run the, run the company. Um, but I, I knew I was going to start something again soon. And, uh, during this like transition period, I was like tinkering with some other ideas. And then this new concept called Uber came to the city I was stationed in and I took a few rides and I was like really intrigued by the model. Uh, I'm in that like early adopter cohort. So I see something new and flashy. I'm like, Oh, well, let me download it. Let me try it. People are just like, you have so many apps on your phone. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? It's like, I, I, I get caught by all these ads everywhere. But the, um, uh, I, I signed up to drive, uh, that curiosity, uh, to, drove me to, uh, to, to sign up to work for, for Uber. So I was, I, you know, second time out driving is where I was just like, really realized I was like, wow, this is surprisingly very difficult. Uh, and I feel like I am just out on the road and I feel like kind of blind in my decision making. I can't, I'm used to making informed decisions with information, all these different things I do in my life. When I go out and drive uh, uh, on this platform, I'm like, I drop somebody off in the suburbs and I'm like, do I go back to the city? Do I go to the airport? Do I stay here? Where do I go? When do, should I go work now or should I do something else with my time? There's like so many questions I was always trying to answer and that. You, you kind of fast forward that perspective carries forward to when I was out of the military, I went into to banking. That's what moved me to Pittsburgh where we started the company. And I was taking a lot of rides with Uber and Lyft drivers, but I was also signed up and actively driving for Uber and Lyft on like the weekends. And that's where after talking to so many drivers, I heard them, heard them complain about a lot of the same pain points that I had experienced firsthand. And that's where it was just like, wow, there's gotta be something that helps like some kind of utility app that helps these drivers better operate. Um, and that's kind of where the inception of Gridwise came about. That's so cool. I love it. So you've been in the shoes of a of a Uber and Lyft driver, so you kind of know their needs. What were the early days of Grid Gridwise like? You know, what was your MVP? How did you kind of <laughs> ease into it? I love that question because no, not many people ask ask me that uh, on these these types of uh, shows. The uh, I would say that the the first version. Um, I, I'll give you two first versions, right? So like. The first one was me just proving out the concept that like people actually would care about this, this, this concept of what I was thinking. 
And it was kind of all, it was focused on purely rideshare drivers than just like rideshare and delivery, like gig drivers. And it was just like, hey, we aggregate events, and airport data and, and things. We pull all this into one place and, and, and it was, there was a landing page. It was designed by me, which means it was really bad. And, and people would come in and like sign up for this, this site that of a product that didn't exist. And so they would, they would go to the landing page, sign up, then they would be taken to AB tested pricing pages and then taken to like a success page that would say that said, Hey, sorry, we're, we're actually under development, but if you're a committed driver, uh, take, fill out the survey for us to help us like build the right product for you. And, and I found like the right channel to target and, and find drivers for free and online. And I had like 500 signups in a week and a hundred people wrote essays on this, this survey, like just, just spill their guts on their, 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 their problems proposed, uh, proposed solutions or strategy, like all sorts of things. And that was like the first like traction narrative we were able to build out to like get some early investment from a startup accelerator called Alpha Lab in Pittsburgh. And they gave us 25K. So we came into that, the accelerator, the second, like the actual real product that we started with is the MVP was um, after starting in, in that accelerator was uh, the first version was a, an email and a text message service. So we didn't build an app. We're just like, we were trying to answer the question is like, how do we get something that is a, a, a real service into people's hands as fast as possible and provide value. And that way we could like get feedback more rapidly and, and, and inform what we should actually build when we commit resources to building the application. And, and so what we were doing is every Sunday, we created this like really painful email that was the bane of my existence. It was like going out and manually finding events and curating this airport traffic, weather information and all these different things. And it was only in the Pittsburgh market. We'd send it out to drivers of Pittsburgh every Sunday. So we had drivers who were just like waiting on that to come out to like, so they didn't have to like do some of the work of like planning for the week. And then every day we were sending multiple text message alerts to say, uh, about things that were happening that impacted their earnings. Like, Hey, it's going to rain in the next 20 minutes, or, uh, it's this event's going to be letting out in the next 45 minutes, this Taylor Swift concert or something. And it was like, and then and from us, it was, it, it was to the drivers from the driver's perspective. It's like, wow, this is very insightful information. And it's all coming from one place on the back, on the back end of that. It's myself and my co-founder, Brian, who are like subscribed to 20 different apps on our phones. And we're like getting all these notifications and then figuring out what to type on this text message service we created. And then we were going to like the concert venues and event venues and talking to like the bouncers outside and being like, Hey, is this, what time is this concert? Going to let out? And we were going out we were still driving for Uber and Lyft. So we drive for Uber and Lyft and then we'd go out there and then there'd be drivers waiting outside and we talk to them. And so it just was like, it all worked together very well. But we did a lot of things that, that didn't scale early on, but that was like the first version of our of our product. I love that example. It's so great. And you got to do things that don't scale early on while you figure product market fit out. How did you, like, when did you know you were onto something and you felt confident enough to start opening up another market? Yeah, I would say it's like when we were able to um, uh, achieve nearly, I, I think it was like between it was close to like 20% of the entire Pittsburgh driver market on that like text message service and email. And, and we just had so many people subscribe to it. And then we, we had this, like this feedback loop that was taking place where we would text people, but then they would text us back and crowdsource information for us to disseminate back to the driver community in Pittsburgh. And so it just became this, like, like this content engine that the drivers in Pittsburgh were relying on to inform them about what's happening in the city. And it was like really influencing the behaviors for how they optimize their work. And, and so that's like, you know, it was pretty, pretty clear early into that where we saw this like, wow, like we're doing product market fit surveys. We're, we're doing all kinds of things to assess sentiment NPS. And we were just like knocking out scores across the board. Like they're, they're just great, like high, very high sentiment. And we're just like, all right, well, this is great. We've proved this out in Pittsburgh. We know that like, for us to, we need to prove out scalability of this as in parallel, we started developing the mobile app. And so we had ended up launching 
the mobile app at the same time we launched like the DC market there. And then soon after that, I think it was two months later, we launched Chicago. We're like, all right, let's pick three markets that are somewhat close together, but are very different. And, and, and a lot of, there's a lot of factors that are, that are differentiating these, these geographies and prove out, let's prove out that we can gain a high traction penetration here. And so we were doing most of that digitally, but we also would go to those markets and go to like the airport lots and do like coffee and donuts for the drivers. And I would say like one of the most surreal experiences was like the first time we went to DC, we had like sort of record wise shirts on similar to me today. And, uh, and I get out of the car and, and right away drivers are like, Hey, it's the grid wise guys. And, I, and we were just like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Like we didn't expect any, like people just like recognize like, right. Yeah. We just had the like instant recognition. They were just like, wow. And then we just had so many drivers come up who were using the Gridwise app at that time and we're getting feedback and then we're signing more people up for it as well. So it was a little more uh, added there than what you asked for, but it was uh, kind of tied to like how we were expanding markets and some of the things. You mentioned early on you found a really successful channel for attracting drivers and then you're showing up at airports and handing out donuts, which is so smart to do that kind of guerrilla marketing in the beginning. Um, what are some of the ways that you attract? How do, how do drivers today learn about Gridwise? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say it's like we have a, a much more robust, uh, predominantly digital uh, digital uh, growth engine in place. So. I would say there's we're using a lot of like the digital digital advertising channels um, that are out there, as well as um, we have a very uh, pretty robust content machine that's that's running. So we're always really focused on trying to um, develop value add content for what drivers in the industry will care about and are producing that out. And so I mean we've we've been building that SEO. Um, engine for for years, and I think after about year two, we really started to see the benefits of that. So have pretty good organic traffic that comes through those channels, and then there's um, strong word of mouth playing out. There's community groups that we've developed, um, and there's some some offline channels that we we turn on and turn off from time to time in different markets as well. A lot of our audience are delivery companies or rideshare companies. And one of the things that we've done a lot of research on is just what do drivers want? Like how, you know, you've, you work with drivers, you've been a driver. What can companies do to actually improve the driver experience? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I would say the first thing uh, ties very closely to, to every is uh, uh I think what you're seeing is this convergence to where, you know, to be competitive and to be f- most favorable to drivers is just kind of ties into not only how much you're paying them, like uh, trying to pay them competitive, like making sure there's like competitive fair wages, but also it's just like how fast you can pay them. And, and so I think the instant payouts, there's like instant payout wars that are happening now. It's like, how fast can we pay someone uh, and it's, it's getting down to the, 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 the trip level now where it's like you can get paid after, you know, completing a trip and, and be liquid off of that, which is really, really compelling. And, and so I think that's, that's one key piece. Um, I think there's, I think a lot of people like to jump to creating, I, I think it's a great initiative, but like when they do this, they create these, um, reward and loyalty programs for drivers and like perks and benefits for them. We do this as well. Um, but where I see a lot of people miss the mark is in trying to create, um, perks and rewards for, for drivers that are really just the same as what everybody else has. (laughs) It's like, Hey, here's this, this offer, this mileage tracker, here's turbo tax service, uh, discount. And, it's like, yeah, I, you see this in like 50 different places. Like it's not really value at it. Like you're providing commoditized offers to, to someone. And so it's just really thinking about like how, how do you differentiate? Like it's great to create the loyalty programs. I understand the purpose behind them. Uh, but I, I think where, I think what maybe helps you think through how you solution around the driver experience and what you bring to them and offer them 
uh, really comes down to changing your mindset to from let me just empower like let me just focus on like ensuring that this worker is engaging with my platform as much as possible and will empower them to be the best x driver they can be um whereas i think the mind shift should should kind of uh go in a direction of thinking through this more holistically of like how do i empower the gig driver as a like as a gig economy worker agnostic of service that they're working for which is yes it is it ties to kind of what we do as a platform but if i was operating a marketplace that's the mindset i would have because at the end of the day you i mean you mentioned this earlier in the episode thing this like drivers are driving for many different services out there and that's that's with classifications the way they are now that's going to persist so embody that and figure out how do i empower this worker to be better a better person a better a better worker just generally and hopefully as they are me doing so hopefully i can carve out a portion of that a large portion of that time to to spin on my platform rather than trying to own 100% of that you can't necessarily compete for their time you just have to make sure that you have an offering that's compelling for them in addition to the other offerings they're getting. I know like what we've heard from a lot of drivers is like predictability of earnings is almost as important, if not more important than the how much they're earning or the speed. They need to know that if they're going to a platform, there's a consistent supply of jobs there. And I think that's something that, you know, is easily overlooked. Um, and then the other thing we hear about is onboarding, just how slow it can be to onboard with some gig platforms. Is there anything like, can you talk about the signup flow for Gridwise? Like, what have you learned? Is it, how are you kind of quickly getting through drivers through your funnel and onto the platform? Yeah. I mean, onboarding is, uh, is not only a, a cumbersome pain point for the gig workers, but also for many of the marketplaces out there because it's, it's very expensive to pay for them to go through onboarding background checks, et cetera. And you have a large fall off of those people who may not even end up completing any jobs. Um, I, I would say it's like, I mean, from grid wise, it's a, it's a little, little more friction, like a little less friction, more, more of a frictionless process because I mean, we are a, today a business utility for those drivers, uh, and, and we're a mobile app that you download and you go through, you know, quick registration flow. We're not requiring you to you know, give us your social and, 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 uh, take a picture of your, your license and, and yet yeah, put in your bank account credentials and things like that today. And, and so with that, um, with that being said, it's like, I mean, you, you add your email, you, you click a few buttons and you can be in the app registered very quickly. After that, you're, we, we focus on like the post registration flows where we try to get you to adopt and take more like, um, actions that could have higher friction. Uh, we put in their post registration and in the onboarding flow, like linking your account to the gig platform you work for or something like that. I, I do, I do think that like to your, um, it, I guess just like one point that made me think of on the, the payment piece on like predictable earnings. I think there's a interesting thing to be like, it, there, there's so much debate again about like the classification workers and how much they're being paid and like minimum wage standards out there. And mm. so like, I think one thing, yes, is like, we, we do hear the predictability piece as well, but it's just like taking a, a step further and, and, and putting a little bit more power in the hands of the, the, the worker to allow them. If you, if you think about a lot of the successful marketplaces out there that incentivize really well, both sides of the marketplace, the Airbnbs, the task rabbits uh, and others, uh, uh, I think th Thumbtack is like, they're allowing them, they're allowing these, these 1099 workers to name their price. If I have a house I put on Airbnb, I, I can get information on what may be the best, a recommendation of where I should put it at or have Airbnb manage that for me completely. But at the end of the day, it's my choice and I'll put it on there and it's going to dictate what I heard. And now I, I, I don't think you maybe want to give like full autonomy of saying like hundred dollars a trip, come and get it while you can. Uh, maybe if you have a Lamborghini or something, you might make, you might get people to bite on that. But same with Turo, it works the same way. And so like, if there's some kind of range of like a you know, fair price that can be dictated by drivers, I think that helps alleviate some of those pressures of the classification piece, but also like gives them a little bit more flexibility of how they operate as a worker rate. 
a key part of the predictability when you think of like the ride share delivery companies today, a lot of them that are more on demand is that wages are being dictated directly by the company. And so tomorrow I, as a gig platform marketplace can change your per mile and per minute rate. And you have no, you can't do anything about it. And like, you didn't know that was going to happen. And now you, what you were expecting your earnings to be later this week are going to be different. Oh, it's such a good point. And that's not something that I hear many. I, I can't think of any companies that allow for that flexibility for a driver to set their price. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll give a I'll give a, a, a nice plug to a company that is doing that right now. I think there's a, uh, they're operating in a few cities, predominantly DC, New York, and I believe one one other right now is it's a company called Empower. So they're they're taking it from a perspective of they're they're operating in a few regions and are I guess that Empower piece is focused on you know putting some more power into the the driver's hands and allowing them to to name the price and they seem to be scaling from from that type of model. So that's an interesting one to to study a little bit more. You talked about worker classification, which is always one of my favorite topics to ask about because it's such, it's so, you know, people are so divided on on where it should land. And, you know, there's new regulations or promise of regulations all the time. And we've asked gig drivers specifically, like, do they prefer, first of all, do they know what the difference between 1099 and W-2, which overwhelmingly they say yes. And then they say that they want to stay at 1099. I think it's like 65 to 70 percent. But then they also, then we've asked, like, would you give up some flexibility if you could have higher earnings or more or, or access to health benefits? And they usually say yes as well. So it's even at the driver level, it's this kind of challenging concept and there's no right or really clear answer. Like, what what's your take on how this will all shake out? Do you think, um, you know, it gets more strict and we start classifying gig drivers as employees? Is there an in-between and a new classification any predictions on where where it land or or where you think it should land? Yeah, I mean, I, I think is um, yeah, it's always interesting to hear from the driver's perspective. I think those we were hearing pretty similar sentiment um, articulated as you have, and I, I do think is like when you ask a question about like, hey, would you be willing to give up some flexibility in lieu of higher earnings? I think the the missing piece of like where, where people say yes to that, it's like where the caveat is, is like, all right, well, but this company can also dictate like what you, it has more authority of like maybe when you work or who you work for or, or not being able to work for others as well. And and I think that was like a, that's like a, a big driver that's like, or attractiveness factor that's attracted so many people to this type of work is like, having autonomy and operating the way you want and not, nobody telling you what to do. Um, and, and obviously it's balancing those trade-offs. I, I think that, you know, where uh, there's, there's the question of where does this go uh, versus like, where do I think it should go? <laughs> and uh, I, I, I I mean, where, where I think it should go is I don't, I don't think 1099 or W2 or either one of them are the right solution, honestly. And so I, I think, like, let's let's just. Uh, I'm uh, I'm not a uh, I'm not a history professor, but like, we think of the history of these classifications. Like, was uh, 1099 was created? I, I believe. Uh, let's see. I think it was like 1917. It was early 1900s in 1907. Sevens in my mind for some reason. Very long time ago. Uh, W-2s were like in the mid, like in the 40s or 50s, sometime around there. And so like these classifications were created well before <laughs> anyone could even envision the types of uh, the, the, the world we live in today and the type of types of work that's happening, the types of types of work you could com- be co- completing as a worker. And, uh, and, and so I, I think that it's just because of that is like, we need to have modern classifications that adapt themselves and fit a modern worker. And, and so I, I think that's where the push push needs to be towards. And unfortunately, I do think that I, I think there's in, in some parties who are pushing these debates, there's great intentions and, and worker protections that are being pushed. Another other constituents or it's kind of about like, Hey, this impacts dollars coming into our pockets. If we're changing these and the, the system's set up to you know, be a, 
to funnel us money in this direction, um, or we make money off of this, I guess a more politically correct way of saying that. Um, so I, I, it's, it's hard to say where, where things actually end up playing out, but if they, if they ended up going into, if they ended up going the W2 route, I, I just think that would just be a, just such a step in the, just such a step back. And it would just disrupt, it would tear apart the existing marketplaces today and, and it would create a horrible, not only like the worker experience, I don't think would be great. The consumer experience would just like prices would be so overly inflated to be able to operate that on a nationwide scale. And if they couldn't, then they have to pare that down to being like having a few drivers in a few regions and not having much availability that exists. And so at that point, we're back where we started. It's so true. Yeah, there's got to be less competition. It'd be a lot harder, I would think, for startups to compete with the gig giants who maybe could balance it. I mean, it's obviously going to impact their margin significantly, but they have more resources to combat it. And I just think it would lessen competition in the end, too, which is, you know, there. I think most consumers think of these giant companies when they think of delivery, food delivery and ride share. But there's so many smaller players that are huge parts in this economy um, and do you have any advice for how they compete with gig giants? Like, how do you, for, for drive, like how are, how do you become an appealing place for a driver to work? If you're not Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, any advice on that front? I think part of it ties into some of the things we, we mentioned around like what drivers prefer. Like, it, it's just like, if you can really deeply understand those driver preferences and optimize for some of the th- things that like it, things that some of the gig platforms maybe aren't doing as well that that's great but i think it that that reconciled with actually like finding a very defined niche um and and i i honestly think more of those niches exist in in the delivery world than they do in rideshare i mean rideshare is very there's not a lot of differentiation you can create in that experience today for from at least a consumer standpoint again we talked about some of the gaps on the worker side but it's not going to, I think it's more of like feature changes more so than saying an entire new business with that differentiation. Um, so I, I think on the delivery side, you're seeing a lot of companies that are popping up that are focusing on like very specific niches. And there's so many different niches and categories and directions you can go within the last mile itself. Last mile is just, we've been just learning more and more about the last mile um, piece lately in our company uh, as we think about how we support those workers better and, and companies in the ecosystem. And, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's so expansive and there's so much opportunity there. So I think the niche can be carved out by kind of business or segment focus, the type of delivery geography of focus, like you'd be really great in one region. I don't think that's, that's a, a, a bad place to be in or is a wedge to start in. I think a lot of companies are spreading themselves too thin in a lot of regions early on. Um, I would say from there, I, I I think those are some of the things. I know some of them are a little bit high level. I, I think one of the takeaways on Rideshare though is right Rideshare is pretty tough to 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 scale into now, unless you're doing something like like what I mentioned with the power early. Like that's a very different shape model that I think is interesting. Um, so you've got to take approaches like that. Yeah. Or like I've had, um, I had Rebecca from Kid Kaboo on the, on a po- earlier episode and that's like right here for kids. That's like not even reached the, you know, level of scale yet. So there, there's a lot of opportunity there. So it's interesting. Niching down can be a really valuable, valuable advice. Uh, it's kind of switching gears a bit. I would love to talk about entrepreneur, Ryan. Um, you post on LinkedIn a lot. I was going through your feed earlier and you talk about how people tend to hold on to their business ideas. They, if they have a great idea for a business, they don't want to share it and that they should talk about their startup ideas and not keep it a secret. Can you talk about that sentiment and why you think it matters? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's, um, it really comes from just, uh, inter- interfacing, interacting with so many different, uh, so many different entrepreneurs or, or people who are seeking to start their own company. And, and early on, there's just this, uh, this like stigma, I, I think comes from like somewhere in the past of the way companies used to start or things that had happened historically in the, uh, back to the early 1900s, what we were talking about earlier. And uh, where people would think that it's like by telling someone my idea, 
they're going to steal my idea and run with it. And, and it's like, I like, I, and going, my advice for people and just in going through this and anybody who's like scaled a, a, a business to any degree is just like understands how hard it is to do that. And I would, I will tell you my idea all day. I'll be like, go do it. Go try. Actually go try. Cause like I wanted, I would make some mistakes so I can figure out how to, how to get around maybe some of those things. Uh, and uh, that will help me actually. So like, I, I think it's um, one is like, no, if someone wants to go with your idea, like I, I wouldn't worry about that so much of someone taking your idea. And what you're also limiting yourself to is feedback and, and feedback is, is golden. That is just like the best, that is the best currency you could have, especially, I mean, just in product development at any stage, but in early stages of just like your business and like, there's so much rapid iteration that has to happen. And that rapid iteration, so much of it is informed by feedback. And so I think you just need to, like, I, I think that was one of the best things that I was able, um, that, I, that I did, uh, started early on, which is like going to, when I moved to Pittsburgh, I, I knew nobody there. And I was going to all these like startup events and just trying to embed myself in the ecosystem. And I was just like telling everyone like what, I, an idea was and what I was working on and things. And yeah, you're going to have people who are just like, Oh, I, does that make sense? Or, Doesn't Uber already do that? Like, yeah, oh, that's not a good idea. And then there's people who are like, Oh, this is interesting. And the more and more I told you, it's like, I collect feedback of things. I got people who are just like, Oh, I'm interested in that. I met like the internal like founder of like Google Hangouts. And like this guy like got coffee with me and like taught me through like all the engineering side of things that like I had no idea about. And like, and just for me telling telling people about it and talking about it all the time and ba- evangelizing my con- this concept opened up so many doors. Uh, and, and so it was like the best thing we could have done. And it's like something I would continue to do uh, moving moving forward. And I would advise anybody who's starting companies to like, tell everyone about it. Friends, family, uh, others who are on the street, just get their perspective on it. I love it. So Gridwise, I think, raised a Series A last year. Any broad advice you'd have for other entrepreneurs going through the fundraising process? Obviously, it's a challenging, more challenging time, I think, than um, it has been in years past. Um, yeah, what advice would you give? I would say, and uh, from on the fundraising side of things, is like agnostic of the the market climate. I think that uh, a, a few pieces of advice would be like to uh, one is to really like box in the timelines of focus that you will have to or the time frame of focus to to fundraise i, I think and, and what i mean by that so it's, it's a little vague is it's like don't say like hey i want to go out and raise i want to go out and raise two million dollars and just start you know have an investor conversation here this week and you know the next week maybe two and the next week one and just kind of string along the process because it's never gonna like it's never gonna bring anything together. And and so what you want to do is be very tactical and have a very strong and sound process and approach of fundraising. And when you get into it, commit your like it, it feels it's the most painful thing of like pulling yourself away from the business, especially at early stage when you don't have many people in the company and you've got to like run like you're, you're operating parts of the business and you're fundraising, but you have to think of what's on the other side of that. It's just saying, it's like, Hey, I, I'm this activity that doesn't feel like it, it's, it, it feels so painful to do on the other side of it is cash that will help fill the gaps that are happening or persisting right now to allow us to grow. And, and so I would say is like, in doing so, you think about, okay, it takes about three to six months to raise a round. Plan that that time of when you need to kick off your, your fundraise and like, let's say it's two months from now. you got to start prepping your materials. You've got to start figuring out, like, identifying who the investors are that you want to target that are like the right ones to target and rank them in, in groups, A, B, and C group. A being like, this is the most ideal persona. They like get what I'm going to, I'm doing. They're very, they're going to be very value add investors. They made like they're, they can help me like really think through how to grow the business or provide some value that's relevant to you. 
and B is like kind of the next tier of that, but maybe maybe it's not as strong of a fit. And C is like, hey, this is great if we still have them, but like they're not, they're, you know, relatively speaking, the B's and A's are not as, I wouldn't rank them as highly. And, and, and you do that at a partner level, not at a fund level, because the partner is who you're going to be working with. The partner, they'd be like so many partners at a fund, right? And so when you go out and when you build that list, you build that list and then you try to find all the intro paths to them. And as you find the intro paths leading up to like when you're going to start getting intros to all of them, then you go, you, you try to get as many intros as possible, fill in the gaps or cold outreach, LinkedIn messages, et cetera. And you have, what I've done is <laughs> I'm exposing a lot of, a lot of my taxes. Some people listen to this and be like, hey, this is what you did. What, what, what ranking was I on your list? And, and, but like you, I had three, three weeks of, of each of those groups. First was C group. C group helps me break the ice. And you go through, and, and, and so there was a calendar link for C group, a calendar link for B group, and a calendar link for A group. And, and then you'd schedule, schedule those two weeks in advance so you can group them all together and had 22 of those, like 22 funds a week on, on each, of those, each of those weeks. And when you group them like that, that helps you time up if you're raising an equity round, time up like when the term sheet will come and, and have them consolidate so you don't, you're not stuck with a term sheet and then like early conversations with so many other firms. And so doing that, I think helps you run a very consolidated and precise process. Like I, I think there's an entire different episode we could have on this whole process, but really I, I think what that's resulted in being very methodical about the process and those are some components that have gone into it is like that's allowed us to raise these, our series A, even before that, our, our series seed round in, in, less than three months um, from, from doing that. I always like to end on a question about predictions. Um, what Do you have any predictions for the future of the gig economy or just in, specifically in transportation and gig driver space? would love to hear your thoughts on what maybe uh, may happen in the next couple of years in the gig space. I think as I mentioned earlier, it's like what we're, uh, is what we're converging on is being instant payouts. I think instant payouts becomes the standard way of, of payment for gig workers moving forward. If you're paying someone within days of them completing work, then you're, then you're, 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 you're missing out on, you're, you're not, you're not in consideration at that point, uh, potentially. Um, I would say that I think that, um, I think there just becomes a lot of, at least on the delivery front and, and just, you're going to see more and more continued fragmentation. Uh, over the, the next few years um, that may start to lead into some consolidation in the back half of this decade. Um, but I would say it's like just there's so much opportunity still on the delivery side. A lot of people are still figuring out how how we're making this last mile more efficient. More and more companies are popping up all the time. Um, and because of that, I think there's going to be a lot of like just very niche focus competition and very like hyper-local competition that exists um, in, in, in different categories on the delivery front. and But what that's going to impact and what that has impacted to date is more fierce competition in, in, in this tug of war between the gig worker and everyone's trying to win their loyalty, as we talked about earlier. And that's making it very difficult for companies to figure out, hey, how do we how do we best differentiate? How do we incentivize the workers? How do we do things to stand out beyond the 200 plus companies that are also doing this simultaneously to us? Um, so I think those things will play out. Maybe one other thing would be like, uh, it seems like we are converging, like the, the classification piece, I feel pretty passionate about what I said earlier. I do think that there's a space where we, we probably see some sort of like federal minimum wage for this type of gig worker going to play. I, I think it's just starting to roll out in a lot of different states. Um, and so that's uh, that's a sensitive topic for a lot of the marketplace as well. But I, I, I could see that coming into play in the next few years. Okay, true final question. What's next for, <laughs> yeah, I know it's sneaked it lied a little bit. No, um, what's next for Gridwise? And if people want to learn more either about Gridwise or from you, Ryan, where can they find you? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say what's next for Gridwise is like we are 
we are really focused in on scaling, uh, scaling our capabilities to really become the de facto operating platform for the gate drivers. So the OS, the place where they manage and asset access all elements of their work. And so there's a, I would say, a, I can say that at a high level, the details are, 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 are coming soon. Some announcements on details will come soon, but I would say like there's, there's new themes that we'll introduce into the application that tie into us really being uh, helping workers better manage and access how they uh, access work and, and really opti- better optimize how they, how they operate. Um, so that's what, that's what I would say at a high level in terms of the, uh, where anybody can find us would be at gridwise.io. If you happen to be a gig driver, uh, you could go to our website there as well, or, uh, go find us in the app stores, uh, and by just typing in gridwise. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Ryan. I've learned a ton from you. This has been a great conversation. Really appreciate it. And hey, thanks for having me, Tina. This podcast was brought to you by Every. We work with gig companies, marketplaces, delivery businesses, and more to pay their workers fast. You can learn more at every.com.